Yes. Uh, we start from uh, from Alexander. Uh, Alexander, could you please uh, share your screen? One second. Um, yes. Yes, I can see your screen. Uh, okay. If you are ready, uh, the screen is yours. Okay. Hey, thank you very much. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My name is Alexander Bulinkin, and then today I'm going to present the CMS measurement of the angular correlations in extreme digit photo production in ultra peripheral laser collisions at 5 TV. Here is the outline of my talk. As I said, I will talk about extreme digit photo production, which is the first step to access novel features of gluon distributions, and moreover, the, one of the project goals is the future electron ion collider. I will start with the motivation for this measurement. Then I will briefly describe the CMS detector and analysis selections. And finally, I will present our results together with the systematic uncertainties. So to begin with, active digits in ultra peripheral collisions is the only process directly sensitive to the Wigner gluon distributions, the most fundamental gluon distributions in the nuclei. And the so-called elliptic gluons, the predicted non-trivial angular correlations of the gluon Wigner distributions should result in non zero azimuthal anisotropies. For the jet photo production, they can be measured in the following way. So, first of all, we construct the vector sum QT of the two produced jets K1 and K2 and the vector difference PT and look at the phi angle between these two constructed vectors. And the magnitude of the spatial momentum anisotropy should be related to the second Fourier harmonic or the average value of cosine of two phi, which is measured in this analysis. So let me move on to the description of the measurement. The schematic picture of the CMS detector is shown on this plot. And in order to select exclusive digest events, we require that we have only two jets in the central rapidity region having trivial rapidity below 2.4. And we look at digests with the transformator greater than 30 GV for the region jet and greater than 20 GV for the sub region jet. These jets are reconstructed using the particle flow algorithm with the distance parameter equal to 0 0.4. And in order to select exclusive events, we reject events with any activity in the forward region in calorimeters, the adronic forward calorimeter, adronic end cap, and electromagnetic end cap calorimeter above the dedicated noise thresholds. We also use the rub gap Monte Carlo that was extensively exploited for electron proton collisions at HERA to model exclusive digit photo production via the photon gluon fusion process. The next important selection of this measurement it comes from the following idea. In, since we have UPC lead lead collisions, one ion emits the photon, which interacts with the other ion. And these events are very asymmetric in rapidity. According to Rabgap Monte Carlo, in photo production, 94% of events have the photon and the data produced in the same rapidity hemisphere. Therefore, we expect to have a large rapidity gap in an event. This gap is defined in the following way. We divide the central track in the shift rapidity bins and the bin is considered to be empty if it has no tracks with a transformator greater than 0.2 GV. And the rapidity gap size is defined as the distance between the edge of the tracker or pseudo rapidity equal to 2.5 and the first non-empty bin. Since, uh, as I said, these events are rather symmetric in rapidity, to understand which of the ions emitted the photon, we define two separate data sets in which one has large backward rapidity gap and small forward rapidity gap and vice versa. And finally, these subsamples are merged by changing the rapidity sign of the jets in the letter. 
we also exploit this rapidity gap selection to reject events from non-exclusive and to photon processes in the following way. First of all, since we don't expect to have additional tracks far from any of the jets in exclusive the jet photo production, we require that the distance from the most backward produced jets and the most backward track should be less than one. And we also require that the backward rapidity gap size should be greater than 1.2 to reject two photon processes. These two selections shown on these plots, both for the data and reconstructed Rabgaf Monte Carlo events. And since Rabgaf Monte Carlo models purely exclusive process, we see the excess of events in the data in the rejected regions. And the particular selections are defined in order to keep 99% of the signal. After these exclusive selections, we show the digest kinematics, the invariant mass plot on the left and the digest rapidity on the right. And from this plot, we can indeed see a very good agreement between the data and Rabgaf Monte Carlo that gives us confidence that the photon flux for the Rabgaf Monte Carlo was correctly tuned from electron proton to photon led interactions in UPC at 5 TV. And let us move on to the digest production. As said, we construct the vector sum QT and the vector difference PT from these jets. And they are shown on the left plot with the absolute values and on the right plot as a scatter plot of PT versus QT. We also apply the following selections that are PT greater than QT which is the back-to-back -back or the correlation limit. And in order to perform the differential measurement in QT, we require that it should be less than 25 GV. And after all the selections, we result in more than 9,000 digest event candidates. And finally, before I talk about our results, I will briefly describe the systematic uncertainties. So the main sources of the uncertainty are the jet energy scale correction that is dominant for the low QT beam. And for the high QT beam, we result in the jet energy resolution having the largest contribution to the uncertainty with all other uncertainties have smaller values. And so, let me move on to the results. These are preliminary results used by the CMS collaboration. And what I want to note, first of all, is that they are not unfolded for the detector response. So the left plot shows the data compared to the reconstructed Rabgap Monte Carlo for the phi distribution, which is the angle between QT and PT vectors. And we see a clear effect of decorrelation in data that is expressed as peaks at zero and pi values are much less pronounced than in Rabgap Monte Carlo. And right plot shows the second free harmonic or the average value of cosine to phi as a function of QT in five QT beams. And we see that it reaches a constant value above 5GV, both for the data and Monte Carlo being lower in the data. Since these are not unfolded results, we also perform the following cross checks. First of all, we look at Toy Monte Carlo in which back-to-back -back jets are modeled and then smeared with detect resolution effects. And we see they have a very clear peaks at zero and pi and also reach the maximum possible value of the average cosine to phi equal to one very quickly. And we also look at mixed events that should have no physical correlations by mixing 
leading jet with five other su sub leading jets from five other events, and we result in uh, the negative correlation that can be expected. So, what we can see is that our measured second Fourier harmonic of the average value of sine to phi is below back to back expectation and also the rub gap prediction. So our data calls for theories to explain the observed dependence. And after we release these preliminary results, these calculations were performed by Hata and Thawasas. And in the paper, they considered soft gluon emission from the final state jets. And emissions outside the jet cones should result that the QT is, should be the required momentum against these jets and thus result in a positive value of Natasha, consignment. you have three minutes left. Great, thank you. I'm fine. And so in the results, they also found that this second Fourier harmonic reaches a constant value above 5 GV a similar trend that we observed with the data, but they had a value 0 0.14 that is lower. However, we also expect a lower value after we perform unfolding in the final results. So I came to my summary. I presented the first measurement of adjuvantal anisotropy from UPC digestion led lead collisions. It is the first measurement of the second free harmonic connected to the gluon Wigner distributions one of the most fundamental distributions in the nuclei. What we observed is the angular decorrelation is that QT dependence of cosine to phi is, was much lower than in the Rabgab Monte Carlo for the photon-proton expectations. And we found that the related theory calculations for soft gluon radiation from final stages has a similar trend in that we observed in the data. And finally, we expect to release the final unfolded results really so soon, so stay tuned. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Sasha, uh, for an um, interesting talk. Uh, now we have time for questions, comments. If you have uh, questions, please uh, raise your um, Zoom hand. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, the first uh, question is from Yata. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I missed the first part, but, but you said after the unfolding, it can go down, but how much can it go down, like factor of two or a few percent or 10 percent, or what's your feeling? Okay, so what we see from the generated Trump government Carlos is actually not shown, but if you look at this, phi distribution for the genetic sample it is slightly below the data so indeed we expect like a factor of two for the so it will be should be rather close to this latest theoretical prediction okay thank you uh, thank you for the I don't see uh, any more questions. Uh, okay, uh, let's uh, let's thank uh, speaker again. Uh, now uh, we can uh, we can continue with the next talk. The next speaker is uh, Michael uh, Glassen. Uh, Michael, please uh, share your screen. Can you uh, see? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can see. Okay. Uh, okay, you can start. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this uh, exploratory study on diffractive diet water production at the electron ion collider. So this work uh, started actually as part of the yellow report effort that has been going on for a year for the last year or so uh, in collaboration with Vadim Guse who has just given a talk um, in the uh, session on hadronic final states on uh, work that we did on ultra peripheral collisions at the LHC. 
But here the focus is on uh, the electron ion collider and our paper um, uh, can be looked up here under this number and um, the results have also entered the EIC yellow report. So um, as an uh, introduction, let me remind you that um, uh, there was already an electron um, proton collider in the past, HERA, where um, we um, had lots of interesting um, measurements and also surprises. Um, and uh, not only deep inelastic scattering with inclusive final states provided a lot of information on proton densities and on, on the strong coupling constant, but also jets contributed considerably to this um, information. And uh, a surprise rather from here was that actually a large fraction of the events, uh, like 10 to 15 percent in deep inelastic scattering were diffractive, meaning that um, the proton remained intact or was only excited to a low lying resonance. Um, now, um, this could be described theoretically um, uh, with uh, yeah, um, uh, diffractive uh, parton densities if you assumed QCD and Reggie factorization, where QCD factorization is actually proven. I will come back to it uh, later, while Reggie factorization uh, in, remained an assumption. <laughs> Now, when these parton densities from HERA, extracted from HERA, were used at different, in different environments, such as the Tevatron. Excuse me, my, uh, Michael. Uh, I I cannot see your changing slides. I don't know if this is my problem or somebody like. Uh, uh, okay, I should be on slide two. Uh, okay, you're on the first slide on my computer at least. Yeah, okay. same here, Michael. Sorry? Same here. It's same also here. on the first slide. Yeah. Okay, that's strange. I see slide two on my screen. Um, okay, I can stop and share again. Um, can you now see the changes? Uh, not yet. No? Okay. This is strange. If you have, if you, if you don't mind, we could ask, you know. Yeah, we can ask the chair to, to, to share and then and, and change the slides. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I can try. Yeah, so I stop and you, you share. Okay. Uh, and I tell you when you should change. Okay. This is strange. Uh, well, I could... well, you want me to try again? So maybe host could help me or can you can you see the changes now? Yeah, yeah, I see. Yes. yes. Now yes. it changes? Okay, good. So we can we continue. Okay, so um, the PDFs extracted from HERA, as you know, uh, they do not describe a defective digit production at the Tevatron, but uh, there is a clear sign of uh, factorization breaking. And uh, if you now move from uh, deep elastic scattering to photo production, a, a desideratum of the HERA results was whether this factorization breaking in photo production, which has a point like and a hadronic component, is global or um, is only for resolved photons. Now, when we now have uh, very soon a new machine like the electron ion collider, um, there are interesting topics that we can study there. Uh, first of all, uh, it will give access to also to electron ion collisions and therefore also to diffractive nuclear PDFs. And um, yeah, one may actually hope also to learn more about saturation, of course, low X physics and relate those to cold nuclear effects. And um, a related process to diffraction is actually when um, you have, for example, leading neutrons, um, which were also studied at HERA, and where you can actually study the virtual pion cloud, um, not just in, in, in protons, but then also in nuclei. So the HERA collider, here's a brief sketch of the H1 environment, um, had uh, in very good instrumentation for these diffractive processes, where in particular with, uh, with forward spectrometers uh, that uh, could um, identify um, intact protons. And there were also um, specific taggers for photo production. Um, okay, I've lost quite a lot of my time already, so I will not go through these introductory slides too much, um, but skip a few of them. This is the theoretical sketch of how um, diffractive photo production works. You have electrons scattered on, on protons or on ions at the EIC. 
um, with uh, almost real photon exchange that scatters either directly or uh, through its hadronic components of the um, of the proton and the proton remains intact or goes to a low lying resonance and, and has a rapidity gap uh, with the central system. Um, yeah, so um, actually it makes a difference whether the proton remains intact and you, you tag it or whether you only um, um, have a rapidity gap so that the, the cross sections differ by normalization. This has to be kept in mind. I will also skip through these slides here because they're not too interesting. Um, I will just show you the result of the H1 fits, which are still the most frequently used diffractive PDFs. Uh, 2006 uh, fits A and B, um, which differ in particular in the gluon at large uh, momentum fraction in the pomeron. So here um, the, the blue one is A and the, the lines are fit B. And these are the PDFs that we have also used in our study. Now for the electron ion collider, we had to assume a certain um, kinematics, um, electron and proton beam energies, and then we took cuts similar to those that we knew worked at HERA. Um, the PT cut on the jets has to be relatively low because of the diffractive um, con condition, um, but we know that at HERA one could actually identify jets down to relatively low PT, so here we use asymmetric P PT cuts also because of well-known theoretical problems with... Uh, Sorry, Michael, I, I see frozen screen again. Uh, again? Oh. On, we are seeing... I, I see page five. Oh, Is this should be page 10 now. Yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's terrible. Okay. Oh. Huh. Would you like me to download the PDF and share? And you can yeah. tell me next for me to move on. Yes. Hmm. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, do you want, I stop sharing and you do it? Yeah, just one moment, please. Oh, it says that your PDF cannot be found. I don't know why on the Indigo page. Refresh the web page. Oh, yeah, reload. I, I just did. I tried twice, but I can try again. Slides are there. That says the specified item could not be found. That's what I see. Uh, okay, I, I tried to share, okay? Okay. Okay, let, let me. Which page do you see now? Uh, wait, wait, wait. I tried to. Okay. Um, no, there is no page. Uh, stop no. other screen. Could you stop? Uh, yeah, I stopped. Screen sharing? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. So please go to page ten. Mm -hmm. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, full screen. Ten. Can you right. see? So, yes. So these are the conditions that we chose, um, energy be, uh, of the beams, uh, defective conditions similar to those at HERA. Um, and then for the theory input, uh, weizsäcker um spectrum for the photons, GRV photon PDFs, and as I said, uh, H1 2006 fit B as our default defective PDFs, central PT uh, scale choices. And the observables that we're mostly interested in are the momentum fractions of the partons in the Pomeron, Z Pomeron, and of the partons in the photon to distinguish resolved direct and direct and resolved photon production. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So these are the um, central results for the proton um, for a cent of mass energy of 92 GeV. Um, we, we looked at different kinematic distributions. On the top left, the um, average transverse momentum of the jets. Top right, the photon momentum fraction. Bottom left, x pomeron, um, which is cut at 0.03. 
and then uh, bottom right, um, the momentum fraction of the partons in the Pomeron that we are mostly interested in. On the top left, you can see that the PT range is, is quite limited at uh, these, uh, um, with these beam energies. It only goes up to about 8 GeV, while at HERA and defective uh, die jet production, we could reach something like 14 GeV. On the upper right plot, you can see that diode photons and all the other distributions, in fact, are peaked at the maximum because you want uh, you need the, the largest amount of momentum fraction to produce the digest system. So direct photons dominate over resolved. Next slide, please. Now, this is um, a perturbative calculation. It's not a Monte Carlo simulation. And if you do a more detailed experimental study, you want to know what the K factors are. So how large the NLO uh, cross-section is compared to the leading order one. And what we see is that the K factor is about two. It can be larger at, at the kinematic edges. Uh, for example, in the rapidity difference plot on the lower left, you can see that it increases as the rapidity difference increases and you go more forward. Um, this makes you wonder whether the perturbation theory is stable, but we know from inclusive um, uh, photo production calculations that the next order, the next to next to leading order over next to leading order is only a 10% correction. So the um, perturbative, perturbative series converges and one should not be worried about that. Next slide, please. Yeah. So when we want to study the uh, Pomeron PDFs, or, um, we are interested in um, the evolution and in, and this, in the X Pomeron or Z, Z Pomeron dependence, the momentum fraction dependence. Here we um, looked at the evolution in two different PT bins or scales. And you can see that from the full black curve, uh, which has sort of 80% gluon contribution in the Pomeron at the lower at PT bin, uh, the gluon contribution goes up um, for, uh, to 90% for the second um, or for the higher PT bin. This is because we used um, H1 fit B. Um, in fit A, if you look at the H1 paper, you can actually see that um, it's, it's the evolution in the scale is pretty flat for fit A. So that is um, something that could be studied at the EIC. Next slide, please. Even more interesting is, of course, the momentum fraction dependence. And let's focus directly on the lower right plot here, which is the Z-Pomeron dependence for different fits. H1 2006 fit A in uh, green dotted is the largest one and fit B and the Zeus fit SJ um, are actually relatively uh, comparable. Uh, you can see that these fits, they differ um, first in the starting scale and but then also in the um, coefficient that parameterizes the high Z behavior. So this is one minus Z to the coefficient C that is given here and it is quite different actually in these fits. It is set to zero for fit B explicitly, and then it's fitted in the other fits. Uh, but the, the result is actually, it, it ranges from minus one to plus one. So uh, quite unconstrained. And one would, of course, like to know much better than that from measurements at the EIC. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, since the range in PT was so limited um, and also um, we were dominated by direct photons, we increased uh, the x Pomeron range because, in principle, of course, uh, this could be done at the EIC. And, and the, indeed, when you do this, you can see that the PT range uh, then increases to, to 14 GeV, similarly to what we had at HERA. And also, uh, in the upper right plot, the X photon now goes down to 0.1 so that the resolved uh, photons contribute more. So uh, that is one possibility. Another possibility on the next slide is of course to change the beam energy. So um, instead of 100 GeV proton beam, um, RIC or the EIC can go up to, uh, up to 275 GeV in, in proton beam energy. And this has a similar effect. Again, the PT spectrum, as you can see on the upper left, um, is extended now to something like 12 GeV. And also on the upper right, um, we go down to something like 0.2 in X photon. Okay, so it would be in, it would be useful to use higher beam energies, of course, um, to go uh, into this kinematic domain and maybe increase the X Pomeron range. Next slide. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I, I told you in the introduction that the question of uh, uh, factorization breaking, which mechanism is at work, is still an open question. I don't have the time to go through the theory here. Maybe just go to the next slide um, because. Um, 
at HERA, um, both global suppression by a factor of 0.5 and a suppression of the result photon component by something like 33% or 34% worked to describe the data. And um, as you can see from these plots here, um, the shapes of these curves are all relatively similar. So it will be difficult also at the EIC to distinguish these different schemes of factorization breaking, um, unfortunately. Um, so um, one would have to have very precise measurements in particular in the X gamma distribution uh, on the upper right to distinguish these different um, predictions. Now, the, the main advantage maybe of the EIC is, of course, that we can scatter on nuclei instead of protons. And that is uh, what I want to show you in the uh, uh, remaining few minutes on the next slide. Um, yeah, so um, diffractive proton de proton densities in nuclei are a completely new quantity. Um, we don't know anything experimentally about them. Uh, so we have to rely on theoretical modeling. And what we chose is to, is to uh, we chose the um, leading twist approximation from Frankfurt, Busse and Strickman, um, which um, yeah, uh, gives a prediction for shadowing um, on, on diffractive uh, nuclear parton densities. Um, again, I don't have the time to go into details. Ba basically, it relies on multiple pomeron exchanges with different nuclei, uh, nucleons in the, nucle in, in the nucleus. And um, then I want to go to the results directly on the next si slide. So these are um, even even one more. Sorry. Um, yes, this one. So these are the corresponding results now for um, diffractive photoproduction on nuclei. The um, shapes um, <clears throat> look pretty similar to those on protons because um, the the PDFs scale basically with the nuclear mass number a times a nuclear correction factor r which turns out to be fairly constant. So the shadowing um, that we assumed here based on the um, uh, leading twist um, model is uh, about 65%. Uh, and we make predictions here for different nuclei from carbon to uranium. Um, and then the last uh, numerical result on the next slide is for um, the factorization breaking schemes uh, now on nuclei. And here, um, the um, rescattering, soft rescattering on nuclei is much stronger than it would be for protons. So if we assume that only the resolved hadronic component of the photon breaks the factorization, uh, the corresponding suppression factor is actually 4%, so 0.04. And these predictions are compared again with a um, prediction by suppressing both direct and resolved photons uh, with a factor of 0.5. And what you can see here again is that uh, the shapes look relatively similar. So again, it, these two mechanisms will be difficult to distinguish, except for the X photon distribution on the upper right, uh, of course, which is the most sensitive. So that um, would be the best distribution to study. Okay, so let me come to the conclusion. Um, yeah, at HERA, we have seen that um, it is possible to extract defective parton densities in inclusive um, deep elastic scattering. And um, the factorization has been shown to hold for charm production, for example, but also for jet production in DIS, uh, which was then later used also to extract PDFs uh, in the fit jets from H1, for example. Now, uh, when you go from DIS to photo production, the photon has uh, the, re the real photon has the difficulty that it has also a result or, or hadronic component. And uh, the situation is then similar to hadron hadron scatterings, where you have um, rescattering and factorization breaking. And the question uh, whether this is uh, the correct description or whether there is a global suppression in photo production is still open. Um, so the suppression factor, we have uh, not only the results from the Tevatron now, but also from the LHC. We know that it depends on the center of mass energy. We have, um, even before the EIC starts, the possibility to study photoproduction processes also at the LHC in, at the LHC with ultra-peripheral collisions. This is what Vadim talked about in the, in the other session. And um, the EIC will then have, of course, a much cleaner environment and a unique opportunity to, to study nuclear diffractive PDFs for the first time, not just in photo production, but of course, also in deep elastic scattering. So let me stop here and I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, 
very good talk. Uh, now uh, we have time for questions, comments. Uh, Anna. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Michel, for, for for the talk. So, in general, you uh, you said that. Um, it's going to be difficult to uh, distinguish between these different factorization breaking scenarios at the EIC. Like, uh, do you think uh, what would it take to to have uh, a bit more concrete uh, discrimination between the uh, these different scenarios? Would uh, higher energy or variation of energies uh, help? Uh, yeah. What is your I think, yeah, I think the point is you have to increase the resolved contribution, right? So you have to go to higher energies, maybe, um, yeah, um, a larger expomeron range, as I said, um, this is the only possibility that I see. Maybe, um, maybe also change the kinematics by going into more into the, the, the corresponding um, forward direction that would also help. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah. You know the, the situation where the, the resolved photon um, contributes more is more in the forward direction from the from the hadron beam. So, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, if not, uh, I stop sharing. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's thank uh, speaker again, and now we can continue with uh, with uh, the next uh, speaker. The next speaker is uh, uh, the next speaker is uh, Ilka, uh, who will talk about uh, photo production of diffractive digest in uh, Uh Oh, you are ready. Okay. Uh, so we can start. All right. Thanks a lot. So I will be discussing about photo production of diffractive dices in picture eight. <clears throat> so the motivation for our work comes from the HERA measurements, as Michael was also referring to in the previous talk. So the, in the HERA, they have measured uh, diffractive dices production both in the DIS regime, so high virtual photons, and uh, in photo production region. So low virtual photons, and they observed that they, they can have a nice description with an NLO calculation in the DIS regime, but applying then the same uh, diffractive PDFs in photo production, the theory calculation or the NLO calculation based on factorization, will overshoot the uh, data by a factor of two or so. So there's clear indication of a, a factorization breaking in the low virtuality region in, of electron proton collisions, similarly as had already observed in proton proton and proton antiproton collisions. So in this talk, I will uh, briefly discuss about event generation in PTA8, then discuss how the <coughs> photo production are separate from other kind of collisions that we study. Then I will introduce our dynamical rapidity gaps for a viable model for hard diffraction. So some comparisons to Herva data and then uh, present some predictions for electron ion collider and ultra peripheral collisions at that age. So PTI-8 is a general purpose Monte Carlo event generator. So it aims to provide an exclusive description of the final state. In other words, creating or simulating all the particles created in a collision. It starts uh, typically by convoluting a leading order pattern cross section with the PDFs, then these the Patterns are traced with the pattern hours, so we generate initial and final state radiation according to TCLAP equations. And then we also account for multi pattern interactions for which the probability is calculated from a regularized uh, QCD 2 to 2 cross sections. We also need to add beam remnants, and then when we have all the patterns, we have to nice event using the Lund string model. And photo production, we need to take into account two different components, as already explained. So we have the direct processes where the photon actually act as the initiator for the hard process. So it's similar like in DIS then. And to calculate this uh, factorized cross section, you need to convolute the photon flux uh, with the proton PDFs and then with the part rate cross section. And then in which we want to simulate the final state radiation and in this processes we only also need to 
uh, generate the initial state radiation for the proton side, but, but not on the photon side. And then we have this result process. So here, the lower charge photon will fluctuate into a hadronic state. Uh, and, and this a kind of hadronic state can be described with the PDFs as for any, any other hadron. So to calculate this factorized cross section, then we need to uh, include a convolution with the photon PDFs here. And what we do in PIT here then is that we first sample the photon kinematics here. And then we uh, start to evolve this uh, photon, a uh, result photon uh, proton system as any hadronic collision. So it means that we can also have uh, multiple pattern interactions uh, with a uh, result photons. So we have set up this uh, framework for some time ago already, and we have compared to different Terra measurements. And here is one example comparison to a inclusive digest measurement by Jews with these uh, kinematical cuts. And the plot here on the right shows the cross section from this measurement uh, as a function of this X gamma observed. It's something that you can reconstruct by measuring uh, the outgoing jets. And in leading order, QCD, it would uh, correspond to this X gamma, which is the momentum fraction of the initiator of the process with respect to the incoming photon. So if we have a direct process, we expect that uh, this X gamma of third is close to one. And then the result uh, contribution gives some, some kind of tail towards lower X gamma values. But due to these patterns of our emissions and other effects, it's not strictly, this direct contribution is not strictly sitting, sitting at one. Okay, moving on to hard diffraction in the input here. So by hard diffraction, we refer to a, any hard processes with a hard scale, which can be described as a color neutral Pomeroy exchange. So here's an example for direct uh, photon initiated processes. So we have a photon taking from the monotron beam, and then we have a Pomeroy coming from the proton, and these two then uh, generate the hard system, which for example, a digestion or something else. And experimentally such uh, uh, processes are identified by having a rapidity gap between the scattered proton and then the other hadronic system in mid -rapid. And for the hard diffraction, one can apply the uh, factorization to calculate this diffractive cross section. So here we now need to convolute also with the permanent flux and diffractive PDFs. So in direct uh, photon case, we have the photon flux uh, pattern cross section, and then the Pomeranian PDFs and the Pomeranian flux from protons. And again, we can have uh, these result processes as well, and we need to add then the convolution also with the photon PDFs. So in Putia, we have now this uh, dynamical rapidity gap survival model included. So there's uh, two different steps in this model. So the starting point is this usual factorized approach. So we generate diffractive events based on diffractive PDFs. So this is something that we refer to as uh, PDF selection. But the idea of the model is then that when we have this uh, interaction between a re result photon and proton, we can evolve that as, as usual and check if we will have any ad other additional part rate interaction between the result photon and the proton. And if we find such, we recheck these events since they would uh, produce particles also in the region where we would otherwise have a rapidity gap. And if, if there are no such MPIs, then we can further evolve the event and then we start considering this uh, photon Pomeron frame. And there we can uh, allow for, for these MPIs as well since they would produce particles only within the, this uh, diffractive system. So the rapidity gap would still survive. So originally this model was introduced uh, for PP collisions and there have been comparisons to data from LHC which are so nice agreement there. And more recently we uh, implement the model also for the photo production. And here are some comparisons to HERA data. So the plot on the left shows the H1 measurement uh, 
for these diffractive digits uh, as a function of W, which is the enumerated mass of the photon proton system. And the plot on the right is the uh, on my juice analysis. Uh, the cross section is plotted as in terms of this mx, which is the mass of the diffractive system. Uh, the dashed line here shows the uh, sort of our result with only using these diffractive PDFs. So something that corresponds to a factorized calculation. And the solid line then when we include this MPI selection. So we recheck these events where the rapidity gap would not survive. And what we see here is that the, uh, this uh, factorized uh, part of the calculation tend to overshoot the data by a factor from 20 to 50%. And also we noticed that here that the impact of this MPI rejection seems to increase with the increasing invariant mass of the photon proton system. So this just follows from the fact that when we have more energy and we keep the cuts for the uh, set energy fixed, we have more room for additional interactions since we are putting more energy in the system in the first place. Also we noticed uh, that uh, we find, oh, find a stronger suppression on this H1 data compared to the juice data, which can be uh, explained by the fact that H1 had a looser cut on the transverse energy of the jets. So again, there's more room for having additional interactions when we require less energy for the trickier jets. Uh, here's a, another comparison now as a function of this x gamma observed from this h1 and u. And first of all, we notice that the, we clearly expect stronger suppression here at the at lower x gamma observed values because we have more of this result for them. But also that the, if we take less, uh, if we need less energy momentum for the actual set production, there is more energy available still for additional interactions. So there's more uh, larger impact from the MPI reject. Other thing that we can uh, see from this comparison is that with this juice cuts for the digest energies, it really uh, uh, focuses the cross section to this high X gamma uh, region where there really are no no room for MPIs anymore, since most of the energy has already gone into the production of these sets. Well, it's the agreement with our model and this data is, is not perfect for this observable, but uh, I'd like to remind that there are some theoretical uncertainties coming from photon PDFs and diffractive PDFs and scale variations. It's not the full picture. But if you consider all the different data in these two analyses, we do find a clear preference for the uh, calculation with the MPI uh, rejection compared to this factorized calculation only. So as a new thing, we have also calculated predictions for an electron ion collider. So in practice, we have just repeated the analysis done by H1, but uh, considered that as in the EIC kinematics. So these plots are calculated with this kinematics, so it's sort of the maximum that can be achieved with the plant electron ion collider in electron proton mode. And what we see here is that uh, if we consider the all, uh, available invariant mass range, we see only very mild effects from, from the MPI rejection here. And if you look at the X, X gamma distribution, uh, uh, only at the lowest X gamma values, we see some kind of a noticeable suppression here, but the cross section there is already very low. So it's certainly something that it's difficult to measure. So the conclusion from this uh, exercise is that the available energy and the kinematic occults typically applied for diffraction push the kinematics in the region where there are no, no room for MPIs and therefore our uh, model for the rapidity gap survival have only very mild effects. But we can also apply our framework for uh, ultra peripheral collisions. Uh, you have uh, three more minutes. Okay, thanks, perfect. So yeah, uh, here we have considered two different kind of ultra peripheral collisions. Uh, one 
in PP and other in prelate. So the process is such that the, uh, in case of PP, the another photon emits a another proton emits a photon, and another another one a promoron, which then uh, generate these diffractive events. Uh, it's uh, uh, might be difficult to experimentally uh, separate such events from a, a central diffractive events where they would be just two promotions. So we have also considered ultra collisions where we have an uh, incoming nuclei which emits a photon and interacts with the pomeron from the proton side. There the uh, photon flux from lead nuclei is increased to the, the higher electric charge and so we can safely neglect the contribution where proton would emit uh, photons. The kinematics for the jets that we have considered are something similar as we uh, discuss, uh, discussed in context of Hever. And we have kept the PTA set up the same as for these Terra comparisons. But since we are considering quite a different energy range, we have a lot of varieties parameter that we used, used to regulate the cross section that gives the MPI probability. So we have two different choices, one which has been fitted to Hera data for inclusive charged particle production, and then our default value that has been fitted to proton proton collisions. And the plot on the left, so now our predictions for proton-less collisions, and the plot on the right for proton proton collisions in terms of this inner red mass uh, of the photon proton system. So first of all, what, what we notice here that uh, if we consider this uh, W range, uh, we see that it's very much extended compared to HERA, especially if we could do this measurement in PP collisions. And since we have also this larger energy available, we would predict a quite a bit stronger suppression from the MPIs than what we had at HERA. So again, the color coding is such that the dashed line show the uh, PDF selection and the solid one, the MPI selection, and the uh, blue and red uh, corresponds to the different values for the screening prompt. So we conclude here that uh, uh, actually these kind of processes would be a very good place to study these factorization breaking effects in hard diffraction since they are pronounced more pronounced compared to HERA and, and EIC. And to summarize, so we have included photo production in, in PCI and it uh, currently uh, enables full simulation of direct and result contributions. And we have found good description of different HERA data. And this framework can also be applied for ultra profile collisions just by uh, using a suitable flux. And on top of that, we have also included our uh, uh, dynamical rapidity gap survival model for photo production, where we can calculate diffractive size production. And it's the same model as has been already introduced in Proton Proton. So we sort of have a uniform framework, which at least qualitatively described the observed factorization, factorization breaking effects in PP and, and EP. And the model only relies on the MPI description on Britia, so there's no need for any additional parameters here. So we have found some support from HERA data for that. And we would expect only mild effects from our model at EIC energies, but we do predict a pronounced suppression in ultra profile collisions at the LHC. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a nice talk. Uh, we have questions. Uh, I think the first uh, question is from Michael. Uh, Michael, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ika, for this very nice talk, which uh, sort of uh, confirms and what, what we also have found. And it's a very good progress to have this dynamical model now for factorization breaking. Um, now, the X gamma distribution we know is notoriously difficult at HERA. And a large part was on the hadronization um, uncertainty. Now you can actually model that in PTI, right? And, and see what the effect of the MPIs on that is. Um, but have you done that? Looked at the hadronization uh, effects in the large X gamma? Uh, I mean, of course, um, 
the result that I shall always include hydronization effects. Yeah, well. sure, but I would like but, to know how quick the effect is. I mean, yeah, but we did, we haven't tried that actually without without a hydronization. Because in effects. the largest gamma, it was always a very big effect, right? So yeah. Yeah, that actually would be an easy check to do that. Uh, just yeah, run the same that thing, but, but to without see how that is modified with the MPIs. Yeah. yeah, 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 that would be interesting thing to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, the next is um, Valentine. Uh, yes. Please go ahead. You. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes. Yep. Uh, thank you for the talk, Ilka. Uh, I have just a question for my uh, understanding. I think it was on slide seven that you said that the impact of this MPI rejection increases with W. So what um, can you maybe explain what this uh, MPI rejection means in, in some ph phenomenologically to my understanding? Right. So I maybe try to explain it using this figure. So. Uh, how we generate this uh, for the production event in PTI is that the, we uh, sample the kinematics of the incoming photon, and then we have effectively a photon uh, proton collision. And from there, we can select these diffractive events by checking what's the ratio between uh, diffractive PDFs uh, with respect to inclusive PDFs, so the normal proton PDFs. And if we find that we have had a, a, a event, a hard event producing digits, which is of diffractive origin, then we can still consider uh, the, I mean, we generate the hard process as it is then, but we then check if, if the, we would have a additional interactions between the proton and the result photon. So then, since both of these are, I mean, this result photon includes some patterning structures similarly as this proton, we can have additional interaction in addition to this diffractive system. And if we have some additional interactions, then we would will probably uh, generate particles also in the region we use to select these diffractive events. So we don't see the diff, uh, rapidity gap anymore, even though the actual interaction was of diffractive origin. I, I hope that clarified. Thank you. Yeah, but, uh -huh. Good. Okay, thank you. Uh, the last question is from Paul. So, so congratulations on getting the description that you do and, and then getting the MPIs in. I think that's really great progress. On the X-gamma distribution, I, I vaguely remember there was a claim from the Durham group at one point that it made a real difference how you treat um, what they call the anomalous contribution to photon structure, or just the QQ bar splitting. Um, is, is that something that should be covered in the, your, your choice of photon PDFs, or is it yeah. be something different? I wasn't sure what PDFs you took, actually. Yeah, so the photon PDFs were from this CJK oh, outfit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, typically, I mean, all of these photon PDFs do include this anomalous component, so this kind of perturbatively calculate part, and so that should be good. should be fairly similar between different uh, photon PDF fits. Uh, this is a leading order fit, so the mo most likely is some some dif difference to an NLO photon PDF. Fit. Mm -hmm. okay. But the Otherwise, these uh, photon PDFs, they mainly diff are different in this uh, hadron like all this vector mesh on dominant part of it is, is somewhat uh, something that you have partnering structure already at the initial scale. Okay, thanks. Can I comment on this? Uh, of course, Michael, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, this, um, I didn't have time to discuss this, but um, Vadim and I wrote this paper on with on a fresh look on, on the this um, factorization breaking question at Hera, where we actually use this Dar Durham um, point-like um, um, description also. So this was the interpolated prediction in my talk. I didn't have time to discuss it, but if you go back to my talk, you can see what the difference is for the resolved only suppression and the resolved plus the point lag from the Durham suggestion. 
Okay, thanks, Michael. Okay, can you quickly say what does it make a big difference? Uh, well, not at the EIC, unfortunately, because it's so dominated by direct, right? But at Hera, it would. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, let me thank uh, Ika again. And now we, we are moving uh, to the next speaker. Next speaker is Tobias. Tobias, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, yes okay. Uh, could you please show your screen? Yeah, sharing. Okay. Can you see and hear me? Yes, yes, I can see. Uh, I can see your slides and uh, I can hear you. Okay, you can start, please. Oh, uh, screen great. is yours. Thank you. So I will speak about infranuclear fluctuations in EA collisions and, and this I should have put in the title from, from the beginning, ultra peripheral collisions with uh, sidetrack. This is uh, work I'm doing together with uh, the student, Arjun Kumar. So you should also check out his uh, flash talk if you're interested in this. So we have seen uh, the dipole model uh, explained a um, dozen times or so already. So I don't have to talk so much in detail about this, but in Sartre we have, uh, Sartre is a event generator for diffraction, diffractive, uh, exclusive diffraction, vector masons and the DVCS, uh, which uses the dipole model. So the photon comes in, splits up into a, a quark anti quark dipole, and then it interacts with one or many two gluon exchanges with a, a proton or maybe the heavy nucleus or light nucleus, anything goes. And in the end, we end up with a, this dipole recombines into a vector mason or a real photon. So we have two models for this uh, gluon interaction. One is the saturated DSAT model, also called IPSAT. And one is the uh, non-saturated, the linearized version, which is called the non-sat. Uh, so the uh, scattering cross-section, uh, dipole cross-section for B non-sat doesn't uh, saturate for large R or for large gluon densities where this uh, DSAT saturates at some value for at large R and large gluon densities. And this comes with a, a B dependence. And this is what this talk is going to be about, and the B dependence on this. But before we get into that, we, I want to talk about incoherent scattering. Uh, most of the preparations for the EIC have focused on the coherent scattering. I'm pretty, very much uh, contributing to that. And then the incoherent Part is just something we want to get rid of. It's a nasty background of orders of magnitude that we have to be very good at getting rid of so we can get all these nice coherent bumps out of the data. Uh, but uh, this incoherent cross-section is also quite interesting, as we will see. So first of all, the incoherent cross-section uh, is through the Good Walker picture uh, uh, directly proportional to the variance of the amplitude. Of the, uh, of the event. So the total cross section is one over 16 pi, uh, and then it's the second uh, moment of the amplitude. Well, the coherent cross section is the first moment squared, and the incoherent is the difference between the two, which is the variance of the amplitude. So all the uh, fluctuations, and this is small x physics, so it's gluons we measure here. So the coherent cross-section, which we want to get through a Fourier transform of these bumps, that is the average of the gluon distributions in the nucleus or the proton, while uh, this is the fluctuations, spatial fluctuations in an uh, impact parameter dependent picture of the gluon fluctuations, which is very interesting because gluons really only exists in nature as quantum fluctuations, the quantum field fluctuating surrounding the quarks or are the gluons. So that's a direct measure of how gluons exist. So this is the picture we have been utilized in Sartre for uh, uh, heavy ions, where these averages are over nucleon configurations in the nucleus taken uh, through from a 
Glauber or Good Saxon uh, distribution. So a few years ago, uh, Heike Mentesar and Björn Schenke, they uh, did the same thing for uh, protons. They introduced hotspots inside of the proton. So instead of having in the dipole model a uh, dipole cross-section, this T of B, as just a Gaussian, one Gaussian, which is without any substructure, they turned it into three Gaussians, uh, smaller Gaussians with a substructure. And then these uh, positions of these three hotspots are distributed uh, according to a Gaussian. So on average, you would retain the original proton, but if you have large enough T, you start to resolve these smaller, these hotspots inside of the proton. So uh, this, uh, they managed to get a quite reasonable uh, description of the uh, incoherent data from HERA using three hotspots, uh, which kind of makes sense in a convoluted way. So, uh, and also at small uh, t, large length scales, we have some saturation scale fluctuations, which helps raise this small t uh, cross-section. It's not in this plot but that comes in effect later. So uh, the first thing we did was try to reproduce um, the uh, uh, results from uh, Mantisar and Schenke. And also we wanted to make our own fit since we, use, we want to use B non-sat as well as B sat for this. And we use a slightly different B sat model than they were using different parameters. So we wanted to make our own fit. So this is for B non-sat, it works quite well. You see uh, the three hotspots reproduces the incoherent cross-section quite well in this region. And also the uh, coherent cross-section is quite well described. And if we go to, uh, so that's with B non-sat. If we go to B sat, we see that uh, the, we can also describe the incoherent cross-section fairly well. And uh, that's this dotted line, but the, inco the coherent cross-section gets affected. And that's because uh, we take this BI from a, uh, this positions of the hotspots from a Gaussian profile, uh, which is fine. But in the BSAT cross-section, the uh, uh, cross-section is not directly proportional to the profile. We have this exponentiation for the no sat, that's not a problem. So for no sat, the average of the amplitude is just the average of the gluon uh, distribution. While for B sat, this is not the case. So therefore, we modify this distribution of the hotspots a bit with a modified profile. So it looks a bit like a Bose Einstein profile, where we have a minus SG here. So if SG is zero, this is the same Gaussian as we had before. And if SG is non-zero, we get something different. So that's kind of, if we have no correlations between uh, the glue ones, we would expect it to be Gaussian. So this could kind of measure the uh, uh, co uh, how correl correlations between glue ones. And we see that we can get a reasonable description of the uh, coherent cross-section with that. And the incoherent cross-section actually gets improved for small t when we do this which is not so surprising since the whole cross-section gets lifted a bit by this. Uh, right, so we end up with SG here is 0 0.3 in this case. So what about larger T? So uh, if we extend the fit to larger T, we see that we can't do it. We can't make a fit with three hotspots, which both takes care of the small T region and the larger T region because we have two different slopes here in the data, one slope here and one slope here. So one way to get out of that is to look at hotspots within the hotspots. So we have a proton here, but if you look closer, we have three hotspots, but we can look closer at them and we get even smaller hotspots inside of that. So if we do that, here are the parameter values we get from, uh, from this. We see that we get uh, 10 hotspots within each of these three hotspots. Uh, of BHS, the size parameter of 0 0.05 or 0 0.09 for non-SAT and BSAT respectively. And we see that we can describe up to six or seven uh, GV squared in T. 
So here the dotted line is the uh, three hotspots model, and the full black line is the uh, three times 10 hotspots for B non sat to the left and B sat to the right. So we can get quite a reasonable description for all this data with this model by adding substructure to the proton. So it's just doing the same step over and over again. So TP is a sum of TQ, the hotspots. The hotspots itself are a sum of other hotspots, which are following a Gaussian distribution, each of them. So what about even larger T? Uh, this is work in progress. Well, everything we present here is work in progress, but this is even more in progress. What about larger T? So uh, from Zeus and H1, we have uh, incoherent cross section up to T of 30, which uh, we can you know, confront with our, our model. And we see that uh, it's we're hard to say, but it seems to not do uh, quite as well as we would have hoped for the largest T around from 12 or so. It seems to have a new slope in the data. So does, does that mean that we have hotspots within hotspots within hotspots in the proton? It could be, but before we just continue this path, we should take a little step back and look at what we have. So if we uh, plot the number of hotspots versus the size of the hotspots on a log-log scale, we see that for B non-sat and for B sat, uh, the result actually is on a line here. And we also put T max, which is the T value or minus T value for to which uh, the uh, each level of substructure seems to be relevant. So where we have the shifts in the slopes here. And we see that they also lie on a line in this log-log scale. So instead of just uh, blindly fitting to this curve, we pick a point on this line and see if this scaling behavior holds for the next level also. So this, I said, is work in progress, but it seems to work. So for this is for uh, non-sat. So we see this is the... Uh, hotspots within hotspots model here, the dotted line, and the black line is coming from this yellow point here. So that is as, uh, seven times 10 to minus four in the uh, size, in the width of the hotspots, and something like 60 uh, even smaller hotspots here. And for B sat, we also get something which reasonably describe the data here, six, ten, six times 10 to the minus four and 60 smaller hotspots. So that's quite interesting that the T spectrum uh, seems to suggest that there is uh, some sort of self similarity, some sort of scaling behavior of the substructure of the gluon spatial densities inside of protons. So let's take this into the heavy nucleus. So what we do is uh, we just implement this into Sartre and you see- have three minutes left. Oh, thank you. And see if we can describe the UPC data with that. So at T is equal to zero, the nucleus looks like no substructure, just a wood saxon potential. So uh, at small t, we have the nucleon configurations. So these are just protons and neutrons. So these are not really the same distributed as gluon hotspots. And then substructure of these, these are three hotspots within each of them. And then 10 on each of these. And then 60 in each of these for very large T. So, so far we have only implemented the first layer. So just a few words on Sartre. So we do UPC, which is a peripheral collision with Sartre. It's an event generator for exclusive diffraction. Cross-section is with the dipole models, convoluted with the photon fluxes as we're using starlight photon flux. Uh, thank you, Spencer, for that. And can use any nucleus. And it's very fast to use for the users because all of the complicated uh, QCD calculations are stored in uh, publicly distributed lookup tables. And here are the uh, references for Sartre. So um, what we have is uh, this 
is what we published uh, last year in 2020 uh, with only so, with no subnuclear fluctuation, but with nucleon fluctuations, nucleon position fluctuations in uh, Sartre for B sat here and B non sat. And we saw then that the uh, coherent cross section was reasonably well described by Sartre for lead lead in uh, five. Oh, it should be TV, sorry, by TV. Uh, while the incoherent cross section was, as expected, a bit too low because we don't have subnuclear fluctuations. So now I've added the subnuclear fluctuations. And uh, as happened with the proton, the uh, uh, coherent cross section gets a little bit affected by this, but not very much. And the uh, incoherent cross section gets increased. So now we've described both incoherent and coherent here. And just to show the uh, coherent cross-section is doing quite well. This is from the new ALICE uh, coherent peak measurement compared to Sartre, just out of the box Sartre without subnuclear fluctuations. It's doing quite well and the subnuclear fluctuations did not change this at all. So now we have come to a place where the data error bars are smaller than the uncertainties in the model we are using. This is very different from the situation when I started with this UPC business. So this means that um, this is a bit lucky. We get the shape quite right, and we also get the magnitude quite right. But the magnitude is a bit lucky because there's models uncertainties in this. And also, for uh, if you saw uh, William Bill's, uh, Bill's talk earlier today, we saw that Sartre is also doing quite well with the coherent star uh, peak. But we want to talk about the incoherent. So we have a prediction for incoherent with subnucleon, uh, sub, uh, subnucleon fluctuations and just nucleon fluctuations for larger T. And STAR has done this measurement uh, for incoherent cross section. And here we saw that uh, Sartre did quite well up to 0 0.25 or so. And then uh, the data is a bit larger. So I could do that. It looks like this. And I can do an ugly superimposition, superposition of the two. So we see that uh, if the subnucleon uh, fluctuation with Sartre gets even a little bit higher than the data here. So this is work in progress. So this might change before we publish this, but it's still quite encouraging, I would say. And uh, just to mention that star data goes up to uh, 2.3, I guess, 4, here in the uh, PT squared of the J psi, which is basically T. So they go a bit further, and maybe they can push it a little bit further also with more statistics in the future. So we might be able to see some hints of a further substructure there. So to conclude, uh, the inco incoherent cross-section contains some very compelling physics, I think, some transverse gluon density structure. Uh, HERA data includes, indicates that the density structure exhibits some self-similar behavior with hotspots, within hotspots, within hotspots, within hotspots, within hotspots, within hotspots, and so on. Uh, so the question is if EIC can increase the precision, I think it's quite obvious that it can, and also the reach on this, since the focus on the EIC so far has been to measure the small t, and for the inco for the coherent cross section. And I would mention that for the coherent measurements, the uh, subnuclear structure doesn't affect because uh, we don't need such large t to get a good uh, coherent. Uh, Cross section for uh, for the Fourier transform to get back the uh, gluons uh, distribution, spatial distribution of the gluons. So it won't affect that measurement. Uh, so the Debesa dipole model we have seen is perfect for this kind of uh, physics because it has an explicit B dependence. So it's a perfect tool to uh, probe these uh, structures. So we have implemented, well, we are in the process of implementing all this into Sartre. And uh, Sartre can describe STAR and ALICE incoherent and coherent JPSI cross-sections, uh, I would say even surprisingly well. 
so yeah, use it. Sartre already contains nuclear fluctuations anyway. So uh, Rick uh, Star is using it. So looking at ULHC, you can also use it. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting uh, talk. Uh, thanks. And now we have uh, oh, we have uh, some questions. Uh, the first uh, question uh, is from Heiki. Heiki, please uh, go ahead. Thanks for the nice talk, Tobias. Uh, can you go to the slide number fifteen? Sure. So uh, I understand that when you go to higher T, then you see smaller substructure and the slope gets less T. But then when I look at the plot on the right hand side, what happens around T equals 20 um, and it again gets more T. And I think this is counterintuitive to me. Yes. Uh, so there is actually what happens here is, um, okay, I think it's clearer here. So we run into some uh, numerical limits here. So this is work in progress, as I say. So yeah, this has to be checked out. So I would also expect, as you say, that it should not be a turn here. So maybe this uh, bin here is a bit too high and we would have some other. So it's some numerical fluctuations is my guess here, but we will investigate this further. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the second was uh, Spencer. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess my question's on slide 24, although it's a little more general than that. Um, yeah. What do you do for the photon PT for in Star Trek? Yes, uh, that is something that Bill has also uh, talked to me about. We, I, um, we want to, to I, I will have to look into it, basically, is what I want to say. Yeah, it's on my to-do list, but I haven't really looked into it. So what's in the current Sartre? For the Photon PT, I'm not, it was, I'm not sure we do anything with it at the moment. Um, it seems like a significant thing to ignore, but OK, thank you. OK, maybe I, I, mean, I need to have go back and look at what we do, actually. OK, thank you. Daniel, please go ahead. Uh, no, I prefer a garlic too because <laughs> it's. Uh, 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 yes, yeah, if it's. Okay. Yeah, garlic. You have a com. You have a comment. Uh, uh, yeah, please. Okay. Stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you there? If, if, if I may, if I may speak, okay. Um, could you go to your to your to your summary, uh, transparency, conclusion. Mm -hmm. Maybe I have a very, very stupid question because you said that your density structure exhibits self-similarity. In a sense, it could be that you could make up the model with fractal structure. So could you, could you relate the self-similarity to, to, to the self-similarity in these peaks you, you, you have here? So in some sense... You mean the coherent peaks? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't so think. So, in sense, the question is whether these coherent peaks exhibit also the self similarity, or there is some, you know, structure know. with scaling structure, which, which could be related I... to the to the to the fractal structure of the of the hotspot. That would be, yeah. I guess that would be more like the edge. You would pick up more detail about with the uh, peaks, right? Well, that's a suggestion whether whether we can think in this direction to to relate this the the this, the, the fractal structure or self similarity similarity structure of hotspots to to to, yeah. to the structure of this of these peaks which which might also have some characteristic yeah. pattern. I, I don't know. I don't know, but but it will be extremely interesting if it's if it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Spencer, please go ahead. Thank you. I had another question which is actually quite similar to what Golik asked, where you have hot spots within hot spots within hot spots. Can't you get, or couldn't we in principle be able to get guidance from QCD about the sort of spatial structure of the hot spots 
and shouldn't it be sort of some kind of continuum of hotspots with different size scales? Uh, maybe, and they should also at some point uh, saturate. Mm. We can't make two small hotspots. Right. At, at all scales. So then we would get something that, you know, deviates from this if it starts to saturate. So do you see any prospect for getting something, learning about this from QCD, i.e. getting more solid theoretical input? I was uh, looking for something like that, but I couldn't find it, but maybe I didn't look hard enough. Okay, thank so you. So maybe someone else could answer that question. Yeah. Okay, thank you very maybe, much. I, I, maybe I can just make yeah. one comment that, uh, yeah, we have a, a study with the Prague group where we find that the number of hotspots saturate when you go to higher energies, when we do the we do the energy dependence of hotspots. Yeah. Ah, yeah, I'm aware of that, yes, yeah. That's the W dependence, yeah. Um. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me thank uh, Tobias uh, again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we can. Uh, now we should uh, continue with uh, with uh, our program. Next speaker is Anja uh, Stajto. Uh, yes, we can see your slides. Uh, can you see the full screen? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, yeah. Now, uh, the next speaker is uh, Anna Stashto, uh, who will talk about uh, small X uh, physics at the uh, future colliders. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the opportunity to give this presentation. Uh, so this is going to be a completely different talk uh, about the future and the future prospects of uh, particular small x physics at the Large Hadron Electron Collider and uh, future Circular Collider Electron Hadron Option. And I will first briefly remind you of the, of the basic um, parameters of the two machines and the kinematics, and then focus on really few selected uh, topics within the small x physics. Um, that is the part on distributions at small x and the potential of these two machines for testing both the resummation and the saturation uh, and um, show the prospects of the longitudinal structure function and then talk a little bit about the um, diffractive phenomena. So uh, in terms of the um, <clears throat> references, uh, we uh, in 2012, uh, there was CDR published on on LHEC and uh, last year we have released the update. So you can find uh, both of these uh, documents with all the details uh, online and in particular, uh, the results that I'm gonna present today are from uh, this update. And uh, there are a number of shorter uh, contributions uh, uh, that are listed here in these uh, references. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the accelerator concepts for uh, the DIS uh, machines, um, so on the left, you see the outline for the LHEC. So the idea is to take the beams from the LHC and collide it with um, uh, electrons from the um, uh, energy recovery lineage. And um, in the parameters that we consider is either 50 or 60 GV electrons on 7 TV protons giving 1.2 TV center of mass uh, EP collider. Uh, on the right, you see the sketch for the FCC where uh, the big ring is FCC, the LHC is then the smaller ring and these would be collisions of 60 GV electrons on 50 TV protons giving 3.5 TV uh, center of mass energy. The luminosities, instantaneous luminosities of the order of 10 to 34, which is not as essential for the type of physics that I'm gonna talk about, although very helpful, uh, but mostly uh, very essential for the Higgs and BSM. Um, in the middle, you see here uh, the sketch of the uh, Perl facility, which is the, the test facility, um, 
um, for LAGC and it, it has some um, parameters that are the LAGC uh, parameters and there was a talk uh, in this conference on, on Perl if you're interested. So this is the kinematics in X and Q score plane. Everything in yellow is Hera. And then uh, this blue um, figure is LHEC range. And then the green is the FCC uh, range, which extends substantially towards the uh, low X and over the large uh, range of Q square. And uh, there is a wide range of physics that can be done within these facilities. I will only focus on, on the small x part connected to the precision uh, QCD, but uh, there is a wide range of physics, uh, the electro wig multi-jet, uh, Higgs precision facility, and um, there is a potential for uh, beyond standard model physics, uh, also the heavy nuclei. Overall, it is a very unique uh, particle and nuclear physics uh, facility. So uh, starting with uh, parton distributions, uh, there was a dedicated talk on the PDFs at LAGC by Claire Gwenlan in the other session. Here, I will just mention the small x uh, features. And so this is the gluon distribution at low scales as a function of x. And here you see the the current uncertainties of the PDFs. And so essentially HERA has kinematic limitations that extend down to five, 10 to minus four. And the LHEC could constrain the gluon uh, to a few percent uh, down to 10 to minus five. You can see here a bit more details um, impact on of the luminosity of the machine on the precision of the gluon. Uh, this light uh, cyan color is the Hera uh, band of, of the uh, certain PDFs. And then you see different, um, different lines correspond to different assumptions about the luminosities. But in general, even with um, the most, uh, the, the initial runs of, uh, that would collect say five inverse Fentobarns, that would be already um, uh, much more constraining than at Hera. Now, um, moving on to more details, uh, we know that, that when we go to small x, there are a number of effects that we have to take into account. And that is the BF color resummation. And then one needs to do additional resummation to stabilize the BF color expansion. And fits to HERA have been performed based on DGLA plus uh, resummation at small x, and they demonstrated improved description at low X. So already HERA data do uh, indicate some uh, need for this type of resummation. And so when one takes this machinery to LAGC and FCC, uh, then uh, one will see a lot of uh, large differences in the pattern density at low X. So here you see the um, uncertainty in the gluon. <clears throat> and then in this blue, you see the essentially the resumed fit um, based on the HERA data. So this gives you this uh, uncertainty. Uh, then uh, the, HERA, the um, LAGC and FCC pseudo data were simulated based on the resummation. And uh, that gives you this um, reduced uncertainty, right? Because then the data are in the extended kinematic range. However, uh, when um, the description is based on uh, next, uh, the fixed order without the resummation, then the resulting gluon is uh, this green band. And so you see the large discrepancy in the parton density already at X 10 to minus three. And this is a very high Q square. This is for the gluon, this is for the quark. Uh, one can look at it in, from a different perspective, just uh, on uh, the structure functions themselves. So here you see um, the simulated data for uh, FCC and LHEC. And then in blue, it's uh, the calculation based on the resummation plus DGLA plus resummation. So the central, so the data line on the central uh, line, and this is the, the uncertainty. But then um, the fixed order calculation would give you this, um, this red band. So, you, so the central value is shifted with respect to the resumed uh, calculation. So um, you see the between 20 to 40% difference of central values for F2 um, in LAGC and then in FCC kinematic range. Uh, the differences are more dramatic for FL, of course, because it's more sensitive 
relative to the gluon, they are of the order of two to four uh, for FL. So um, DGLAB fit will likely fail at the LAGC range. This is a strong statement, but I think that there is some indication that that might be happening at HERA at very low at very low X. And uh, you, we see that this might um, uh, be really relevant for this regime. And therefore, the resummation will be mandatory for uh, both LAGC and FCCEH. Likewise, uh, this is also the region where another type of effects can come on top of that, and that is the saturation. And we have um, a theory that predicts the existence of the saturation scale and then the data need to tell us where the saturation scale um, will position itself on this x and q square plane and so the following exercise uh, was done uh, at the LHEC where the data were simulated with saturation in some low x region and then the rest was uh, with DGLAB and then um, uh, there were several sets of data uh, simulated and then fits of DGLAB were performed to these data to um, quantify the tension or uh, to see whether there is agreement or tension. So this is the result. So here on the left, you, uh, this is sort of the um, self-consistency check where the data are uh, simulated based on DGLAB only and then the DGLAB is fitted to this data. And of course you would expect that the distribution of chi-square uh, of these, uh, when you repeat these uh, comparisons in, for different sets of simulated data, mm, the, the chi-square is around one and before the fit and after the fit, and this is consistent. On the other hand, there are large differences when the DGLAB is compared to uh, the data with saturation. So this histogram is when the comparison of the description of DGLAB is done before uh, the fit and then the fit is performed to the data and then you move to this histogram. So that means that DGLAB has enough flexibility to accommodate at least part of the saturation. However, uh, not all. It turns out that at least in the LAGC kinematic regime, when you look at the two distributions post fit, then they still differ. So the LAGC can distinguish, at least within this model, between the DGLAB and saturation. Now, um, even better if one has a measurement of the longitudinal structure function, because uh, simultaneous measurements of F2 and FL provide uh, the way to pin down this dynamics at all x, because this is an independent constraint. So the simulation of the um, longitudinal structure function was performed um, using three sets of energies with these integrated luminosities. And there were, uh, these are assumptions on the systematics. <clears throat> the analysis was uh, performed uh, using this Rosenbluth uh, decomposition by performing a slope uh, of the fit to the reduced uh, um, performing the fit um, to this uh, reduced cross section. Uh, the measurement is dominated by the systematics, <laughs> but uh, here you see um, the quality of the data for the LAGC as compared to the uh, H1 data. So uh, th there is a good prospect of a very high quality data for, for FL that would allow for, to discover departures from uh, DGLAP. Uh, moving on to diffraction, uh, where we saw at HERA a lot of uh, events that uh, mm, uh, were characterized by the presence of the rapidity gap. And uh, this is interpreted as uh, some colorless uh, exchange. And uh, there is a close relation between the diffraction and small x dynamics, shadow shadowing, saturation. Uh, and, and so the study of diffraction is, is of utmost uh, importance. And here in, in here we see the Q square and X plane where the data are HERA data for a diffraction in this blue band. And then you see the orange, which is the LAGC and the blue, which is FCC. So there is this extension in, into low X. And then in this magenta, you see the EIC, which has part of the overlap with the HERA and also extension towards a uh, very interesting large uh, X uh, region. And we had also a talk on the EIC, diffraction at EIC uh, yesterday by Wojtek. Um, uh, three Sorry? more minutes. 
Three more okay. minutes. Thank you. So uh, this is the LHDC phase space in uh, beta and Q square for fixed uh, C, so a bit more differential, uh, where you see quite a large range um, in uh, beta and Q square for fixed C, which is the momentum fraction of the pomeron with respect to the uh, to the hadron. Uh, and uh, interestingly, if you go to even higher um, energies for FCC, you can see that there are new states like a TT bar production in the diffractive states. So everything that is above this dashed line, this dashed line is uh, um, TT bar threshold is a diffractive um, TT bar, which, uh, which is also very interesting. So um, given that um, simulation for uh, sigma reduced in diffraction were performed, this is for the LHEC and this is for the FCC. So this is sigma D3 as a function of um, beta in beams of Q square and C. This is only selected set of data. So here you see the, the quality of the data. Uh, here I would just mention that uh, basically the, the data are dominated by the systematic, which we assume to be in a conservative range of, of 5%. Uh, from there, you can extract the diffractive uh, PDFs. Uh, so here is an example of the gluon PDF for two different scales. The range of HERA is this uh, dotted line. This is LAGC and FCC basically and somewhere here. Uh, this uh, band uh, is uh, from Hera and then there are different uh, fits. So uh, this uh, colorful band is what you get after including the LAGC data in the diffractive fit. So you have reduction of uncertainties, uh, which is also illustrated here in this relative uncertainties plot. This red band is for, um, 50 TV and the outer band is for uh, 7 TV. So uh, you, you get a lot of constraints on diffractive PDF just from the inclusive data alone. Uh, we have not included any digest uh, data, which also could provide um, additional uh, constraints. And of course, this gives you uh, a lot of prospects for uh, all kinds of uh, tests, like tests of factorization, uh, breaking both collinear and, and soft. Uh, two more uh, results. Uh, so I just show you the uh, um, simulated data on inclusive diffraction on nuclei using the model by Frankfurt Guzzi and Strickman with also rather conservative uh, assumptions, 5% systematics and uh, two inverse femtobarns uh, luminosity. We have not performed here the extraction of nuclear uh, PDFs because there are no um, nuclear PDF data from Hera. Hera didn't do this, uh, didn't have nuclei, but this would be the first, uh, the first um, measurement um, and possibility of extraction nuclear PDF, DPDFs with similar accuracy to the proton case. And the final result, um, and uh, there has been a lot of um, results on um, and simulations on elastic diffraction of vector mesons for LAGC. And um, this is the machine that has a wide range of um, T and W and Q square uh, kinematics that could be covered. So here is just the slope D sigma DT as a function of T for two different values of Q square and the type of effects that you could observe at this machine. For example, the difference between uh, the saturated and non-saturated by observance of these dips, as well as observation of the dip position as a function of Q square, which should uh, shift to a different uh, T. So uh, in summary, um, uh, I showed you that uh, the, the LAGC and FCC are DIS facilities that uh, I think represent a really unique opportunity to, to advance the, the particle physics. Uh, there is a broad physics uh, potential from QCD through electroweak Higgs and uh, BSM as well as physics with nuclei. Um, I listed few things uh, in terms of the, the small x uh, phenomena, but uh, this is rather uh, also, very selected uh, list. So uh, there are more um, 
more studies that uh, were performed and you're welcome to look at, the, at uh, our CDR update. Uh, and as a last, uh, if you have missed uh, some talks, there were a number of talks on LAGC and FCC at this conference, uh, which are listed here. And tomorrow there will be um, DIS uh, physics at EIC and LAGC and connections to LHC. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anya, uh, for a very nice uh, talk. Uh, now we have time for questions. Uh, Spencer, do you want to uh, ask? Sorry, that was left over from before. Okay. Uh, I don't see um, any questions uh, or comments. Uh, so um, let's thank uh, Anya again. And now we are moving to the last uh, talk today. Uh, the last speaker is uh, John. Hi there. Uh, uh, hello, uh, could you share your screen? Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, you see it? Yeah, yeah, very nice. Okay, uh, you can start. Uh, screen is yours. All right. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk, everybody. Uh, we have something different for you. you. You might have heard out in the world that there's been a revolution, a renaissance in how quantum mechanics is, is used and how people think about quantum mechanics. A lot of this has to do with uh, the new recognitions of entanglement and a thing called quantum tomography. Uh, quantum tomography builds up uh, high dimensional structures from low dimensional projections and allows you to reconstruct entire quantum mechanical description of systems in a model independent way. And so we are applying these, these uh, revolutionary, let's say variations of quantum mechanics that originate from quantum computing in uh, studies of collider physics. So we have something different. We don't use a parton model. We don't assume factorization. What we have is, uh, a different way to analyze data. You start with four vectors, construct density matrices, extract quantum mechanical information from the density matrices. Now here's some, some results. This results come from actual real simulated data. But, uh, let's suppose we have some, some digests, some LHC digests, this has been discussed by our first speaker today. Some as mutual distribution of the digests and uh, then you uh, put uh, a curve through that distribution. But under that distribution, I show some other curves. As a matter of fact, the distribution is made of two independent distributions. The sum of those two distributions are in the quantum mechanical description. But the classical distribution, where you just bend things and make distributions, you only have one distribution. And I'll be describing how we begin with uh, raw data, four vectors, we process it, and we bypass the construction of things like the structure functions, parton models, factorization. Those things have a role in, uh, <clears throat> in this process. You can talk about entanglement in terms of how things are factorized, but it's not an assumption. Now, one thing I'd like you to know is that, is that quantum information, quantum probability is different than classical probability. Quantum probability and entanglement uh, represent things that are a generalization of quantum, of, of probability theory outside the domain of distributions. 
So in a, in a beginning quantum mechanics book, uh, like uh, you know, Griffiths, for example, uh, the wave function in quantum mechanics will be defined in terms of classical probability, the probability to find a particle, a distribution of particles. Well, that does exist in quantum mechanics, but it's not the whole story. So quantum probability has lots of non-classical information. And the world is, is more interesting than just making cuts on classical distributions. If you make a cut on the construction of a quantum mechanical density matrix, then you're suddenly doing things which you cannot do in classical physics. Now, what do I mean by the fact that you cannot do some things with classical probability? Uh, here's a Kolmogorov axiom. So I've, I've, I've indicated it right here. Now the probability of two channels and the probability of the union of channel A and B in some logical sense is the sum of the probabilities coming through each channel minus the probability of the intersection so you don't overcount. The intersection region is in both, so you don't want to overcount that right there. Now, um, it's a very elementary but instructive experiment. We take two polarizers and cross them. Yeah, the cross polarizers, no light comes through. One's zero and one's 90. And so then the classical absorber theory, that's a probability theory of light, would say that uh, this thing is just black glass. And now you take an absorber, a 45 degree polarizer, put it in between, and light comes out the other side. Light comes out, and you see light coming out of an absorber. So the minus sign in this intersection is violated. And this very elementary, uh, let's say fact, uh, known for wave optics, known for facts of polarization since the 1830s, is the origin of all the paradoxes like EPR, Bell inequalities. Those things come about because uh, Miseducation using classical probability leads to terrible surprises when you come to entanglement. That entanglement is really a polarization feature. It's, it's not something coming from quantum mechanics. It's coming from the formalism of density matrices. Now to describe a, 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 a quantum probability properly, you need a density matrix, which is something that has positive eigenvalues no other properties are needed to be listed in the book, but you just need a matrix with positive eigenvalues on a space. Now, our procedure, we take data, we construct a matrix with positive eigenvalues on the space of the data. And the expectation value of an, an operator uh, is given by this formula. Now, that formula is a generalization of this formula that you've seen from beginning quantum mechanics. And the beginning quantum mechanics formula, in fact, is wrong in general. The reason is beginning quantum mechanics assumes that a density matrix will be the outer product of two wave function, of a wave function with itself. That's rank one. Can I write that on the slide? Let, let me. So any matrix has rank one if it only has one non-trivial eigenvector. When it's rank one, then you get beginning quantum mechanics. When it's not rank one, you don't get beginning quantum mechanics. And as a matter of fact, the wave function can be defined as the eigenvector of the density matrix when it happens to be rank one. Now, in a few minutes, I'll show you that the density matrix is completely observable in physics, maybe not in textbooks. It is observable. And that means that the wave function is observable. The trick here is in what you observe and how you deal with the, with the, uh, uh, the uh, puzzles of beginning quantum mechanics. So what is quantum tomography? Quantum tomography is a way to reconstruct the density matrix by building it up from projections. The trick is, is that you have this trace that we've seen right here. And that traces an inner product 
of two matrices. Trace of two matrices is called the Hilbert Schmidt inner product. But if you just unwrap the matrices and make big vectors, you get the same thing. Now, suppose you have a complete set of matrices as vectors. That means there's enough matrices to span the space of Hermitian matrices. There's n squared matrices on an n-dimensional space. There's not, not that many. Then the matrix row will be equal to the sum of all the projections onto those uh, basis elements uh, times the basis elements. Because you simply put in the complete set in the middle of a row right there. And so you reconstruct the density matrix as a sum of all the observable components. I'll move that right there so you can see that. Then there's the basis elements that you started with. And the density matrix you reconstruct is given by the probes that you used. So any notion that you have to be exhaustively complete is inherently uh, wrong-headed. You don't have to measure everything in the universe. You use a number of probes. Those give you a number of observables. And that's the density matrix you reconstruct from that data. Uh, this is published here in this paper. And we even have a working code online but it starts with four vectors. This paper is dedicated to lepton pair production. And uh, the, the, the issue then is, what would you like to describe? And that is, choose a probe, put in an operator, make some measurements, parameterize the density matrix, reconstruct it, and do quantum tomography at home all by yourself. Now, the issue is, is that the density matrix must be positive. Now, positive means it has positive eigenvalues. That positive eigenvalue constraint is nonlinear because you know, eigenvalues are uh, fiercely nonlinear functions of the matrix elements. So positivity is something which is misunderstood yeah, in the literature. There are almost no experimental papers which have uh, I'm getting a chat here from someone, almost no experimental papers that have positivity uh, uh, done correctly. They all think it's a positive cross-section. No, you have to have positive eigenvalues, which is a quantum mechanical thing. So how do you measure, how do you keep positivity going? Well, if you make a matrix from the form MM dagger and you parameterize the matrix M as upper triangular, and it has the same number of matrix elements and freedoms as the density matrix, and it will automatically be positive. So simply making this parameterization is revolutionary for data analysis. All the data analysis on angular distributions in general will violate positively someplace, usually because some previous theory introduced its version of positivity within its very limited framework. Now, after you have parameterized the density matrix with these numbers, these real numbers, concrete real numbers, then you put the density matrix into the trace, put in your experimental probe, which is something that you're supposed to understand or that you model. If you use a model, you put the model in there and you'll know about your model. And then the rate, the probabilities you're talking about are going to be the trace of that density matrix with the probe. So for example, suppose you have two jets, okay, in an inclusive process. Suppose it's two leptons. Suppose it's two anything. Two anything, okay, it just has two degrees of freedom. So it doesn't really matter what it is. It's that two anythings only has six variables in the final state for momenta and two possible invariant masses. So the angular distribution formulated in an appropriate Lorentz invariant, squeaky clean way, which I'm we sorry, do. Sorry, you have three minutes left. Thank you. No, no frame dependence, no funny stuff. That, uh, that dependence is then parameterized in terms of those M parameters. And we just fit those M parameters. And it turns out positivity is exact. And there are no local maxima or local minima. After we have the density matrix, we can calculate the entropy. 
The classical entropy is not equal to the quantum or entanglement entropy. The classical entropy comes from a distribution. The other one comes from a density matrix. These are not the same concepts. And then we compare a classical fit, ill condition with multiple minima or maxima of likelihood and one distribution with the quantum fit where we have more information and a quantum entropy. Now we've done this exhaustively for some data from the Atlas collaboration. There's actual simulated data here, okay, appropriate to the CMS uh, thing is coming soon in a preprint. And we can do this with anything. And the message I wanna tell you is we find new things. We can fit a classical distribution. In fact, the fits are beautiful because we don't have these fitting difficulties caused by incorrect classical methods. But we also find new things like the quantum entropy. We can watch those new things as a function of all the variables in the problem, the rapidity, the transverse momentum, all that stuff. One of the things we're working on now, next target, is the production and decay of onium. Uh, onium uh, angular distributions are of great interest to people, but they're generally uh, a very chaotic uh, framework, very chaotic experimental situation, where I think the experimental error bars have been exaggerated uh, due to systematically incorrect theoretical methods and uh, systematically ineffective classical data fitting procedures. Now to finish, uh, you have a quantum mechanical problem. You have a quantum mechanical description. It needs, a, it needs a density matrix at the bottom of it. We fit the density matrix. We bypass everything else. And we find new things. It's marvelous. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Krzysztof. Uh, Krzysztof, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. So uh, I have a question. I mean, you, you flashed uh, quickly the formulas for the entropy, but uh, I, 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 I didn't get which entropy do you actually calculate? We calculate the quantum entropy because anybody ah. can calculate the classical entropy. Okay. All right. So you have to have the, de the density matrix to do the quantum entropy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the classical entropy is telling you something about the classical distribution. That's an interesting thing to look at. The quantum entropy is not equal to the, to the classical distribution. Now, a way to think about this, uh, to give you an orientation, is that if you go to the diagonal frame of the density matrix, since it's Hermitian, you see positive numbers, which add up to one along the diagonal. The trace is one by convention. So you can interpret those positive numbers as classical probabilities in that frame. And that's how you get to the classical probability misconceptions of beginning quantum mechanics. Now, I suppose your density matrix is not diagonal, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, if it's not diagonal, you still have a series of off diagonal observables because the observable, uh, the trace, the trace of A and rho, okay, that's a projection of that observable uh, operator onto your matrix. So you have more information. That's the, that's the point. Okay. Point is, is that you get more information with a density matrix than you do with a classical fit. Okay, I have one more question. I mean, recently there was a paper by Karcejev and Levin who related the gluon density to entanglement entropy. Do you see any relation uh, between your framework and, and their framework? Yes, uh, uh, they are different. And I have a paper uh, in the proceedings of DPF uh, 19 in Boston, which discusses this at a high level. So I've suppressed the technical level in this talk, but uh, to talk about entanglement properly for a structure function, you need to deal with what's called separability. 
So a separable density matrix is one which can be written as a positive definite sum of other, other density matrices. Okay, that's where you find entanglement. Okay. Not, not at the level of the gluon distribution. So we, we disagree. I, uh, I don't think that what Karjaev has been do doing with, I maintain that what Karjaev has been doing with entanglement is, uh, let's say incomplete to be diplomatic. Uh, you, you can't always be wrong because there's always cases where something stated will be true. But we work with the highest degree of generality because we want to stay, maintain generality and not, not start inserting models too early. All right. Thank you very much uh, for your answers. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Krzysztof Golet. Uh, I, I have a question. I missed a point somewhere. Uh, you are using the uh, density matrix or density operator. Uh, it means that um, your quantum state is not the pure state, but, but, but the mixed state. So uh, why is it so? Have you traced uh, out of some uh, degrees of freedom which are not observable? That's why you have the mixed state or? It's a, or, it's a good question. The, the, question is, using raw? the question is, if, am, am I doing something non-standard where my initial state is not a, a pure state, but a mixed state? The answer is all collider physics starts with a density matrix. Uh, you don't actually measure anything with a pure state because the pure states are polarized. When you talk about an unpolarized proton initial state, there's no wave function for that. There is no wave function for an unpolarized initial state. Okay, you are tracing, you are tracing over the, the unobserved degrees of freedom, okay. Mm -hmm. And so all of us trace over the unobserved initial spin degrees of freedom. Now you have to talk about the final state. In an inclusive reaction, there's a bunch of unobserved degrees of freedom, right? And that an inclusive reaction has traditionally been described by uh, taking the square of the wave function, summing over X with a symbol, okay? And then parameterizing that with a structure function. Well, that's the density matrix is the more general concept that includes all those procedures. So when you sum over the final states of an inclusive reaction, you're tracing out those degrees of freedom in the Hilbert space. So both the initial, both the final, and then what you measure, because when you measure the, the uh, uh, let's say a two jet correlation, or the, the angular di distribution of, uh, of, of two things or three things, you summed over all the other stuff. And so you're taking an enormous Hilbert space and you're reducing it. Now, the difference between our procedure and the traditional one is that quantum field theory developed from 1930s was designed to be completely exclusive, parameterize everything, and then, then sum over stuff at the, at the end like summing over final spins, averaging over initial spins. But that's a huge superstructure, which actually cannot be observed. So we truncate the entire formalism to the system that's observed. It's tremendous reduction in complication. That's why we don't have a parameterization of structure functions, which include many pieces that will not be observed. And I said that the, the part of the matrix that you would observe was the part that's, that's in your probe. Okay, if my pencil's still working here, it's really fantastic that we can characterize the probe and we don't have to know more about the density matrix. That's what gives us this beautiful simplicity. Simplicity of expressions like this come from the fact that the probe is simple. You can't make that many, uh, terms or operators out of two jets. There's just not that much complication there. Now you look at three jets, you, you change the probe and you have a more complicated final state density matrix, which allows you to measure a more complicated system density matrix. And they all match. It's an orthogonal set of, of probe density matrices matches term by term by term with the corresponding term you are able to measure in the system. 
So this is really a different way of thinking about uh, quantum mechanics. It's very bottom up, incredibly direct, and uh, incredibly uh, driven by what we could actually measure. So we don't over parameterize or under parameterize anything. Thank More you. questions. Okay, thank you very much. Time for me to stop sharing. Krzysztof, uh, Krzysztof do you want uh, to comment or? Um, I, I don't see. Okay, uh, you, you can stop, you can stop. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so uh, I think we can uh, finish uh, the session now. Uh, I'd like to um, thank all the speakers today uh, for the very interesting talks, uh, for beautiful results, and uh, all of you for your for your questions, comments, uh, and uh, discussions. Thank you very much, and uh, see you uh, tomorrow. Thank you, John, again. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you.